welcome everybody for the sunday evening and hope i make it interesting uh, for everyone here um the topic that uh, we are going to discuss and uh, hopefully it is useful for everyone to give an overview of how um controls um, um so i i i specifically specifically come from this background of controls design and how do we do this model based controls design is what um uh, our topic is going to be for the day um so this includes um so this would be the agenda so um um at the end of the session we can definitely take a q and a um um had 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 uh, um expertise for over uh, 7 to 10 years in this field right now um so the topics that we'll go through for this session would be including some day to day controls example just to get prepped up and see that controls is everywhere around in our life um the second point that we'll discuss is like mostly how is the application of controls in varied industries so you can say that when you learn this topic um it's widely um uh, um implemented and widely used in various industries so it's not particularly for just um uh, automotive or um aerospace or anything so it is widely um widely used and um, what are the topics covered in detail within when you take this course later um and what are the various tools that you would be using as a control design so this is to um get an insight of how varied the tools are and what uh, students would be interested in looking for in the future uh, as they grow uh, uh um more into this um controls design or controls oriented um job opportunities and so some fundamentals and then we can do a small demo and case study so this demo and case study is more of something that i have done offline so not something uh, uh, so we can see some results how did we go about modeling something and how did we do some controls and what are the state of the art technologies in in the in the moment um in in this industries uh, where controls is applied and uh, how has you now what is the future and what are the other topics that you can take in the future um so we uh, this course might give you a like a overview and a very uh, basic controls design course um if you are more interested in the field what else can we add on uh, to this field and how 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 big is um controls as a field and what career path and job opportunities are some of the examples uh, that i'm going to show um without further delay um i can go on to the next slide so yeah so day to day controls example so you sit at your home and then um uh, you feel hot and you go and then play with your fan regulator so this is the olden days where you have the knock knock um um uh, like uh, where you change the plug point or the change the uh, points on your fan uh, you say level 1 level 2 level 3 so basically what you are trying to do is your body acts as your sensor uh, which is basically telling you you're feeling hot or you're feeling warm and you are trying to change the speed of the fan or the regulator by changing this regulator and what in in uh, at the behind what is happening is basically you are changing the resistance uh, uh from the supply and the current flow is changing inside to the motor that is driving the fan so this is a very simple controls problem not many people realize what is happening behind but is a good intuitive that where i started gaining okay what's happening behind right what is what is this um that's going on and it's it's a basic simple controls uh, where you have your body as your sensor the plant is basically the fan and the motor which is basically trying to run based on the current supply that it's it is seeing and uh, the actuator is basically your hand trying to move these and changing the resistance in the um uh, uh, by changing the resistance by moving your regulator and the control is your body thinking about it and your your brain processing it and so it's a basic simple uh, uh fan uh control that you have right and you go take a shower every day um what you do is your body again acts as your sensors you feel cold you feel hot uh, and you you change the valve of um um the shower valve uh, varying between the hot and the cold temperatures as you need um so this is again a very simple controls problem and apart from all what you do manually there is also controls that is going within your body uh, that it's doing um, the your body inside within is doing self it's like uh, autonomous control that it's doing within uh, so what you see is uh, for example so what would would on the right hand side you see the picture of the liver and pancreas right like 
what happens when you eat your food is basically you get a lot of glucose in. And what pancreas does is basically stimulates this insulin production and asks the liver if you have more glucose to convert that glucose to glycogen. And whenever needed, again, whenever you are you know, running, you're jogging, you're walking, again, this glucose needs to be back into your body and the liver converts that by releasing some, now pancreas triggers that, uh, um, uh, senses that body needs that glucose, it stimulates the liver to convert that uh, glycogen, whichever is stored as glucose, uh, will be back to generation of glucose and the body uses that. So what is happening here is pancreas senses that your body needs glucose or not and triggers an uh, actuator like a liver to do its process and the body uses glucose or stores it as glycogen when you don't need it. So any control system uh, will have a basic architecture of this, which is basically saying you have a plant, which is basically what you're trying to control and what you're trying to regulate. And there are some sensors to sense something that, uh, okay, if this is increasing, if this is going down, uh, what do you need to do? And the controls decides that. And then the actuator, which is basically like a liver, does its process of converting into one form of, uh, or the other. And this is all happening in your body like a plant. So this kind of an architecture is basically suited for any controls is what I wanted to drive away uh, from this slide. Um, so that's, 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 that's about it. So it's all around, controls is all around. And that is something that makes me excited that, um, okay, it's around and I need to know what is happening behind. And uh, that, that's what brought me basically into this field. More controls applications. So this is more wider, moving on from the daily controls that you see, uh, uh, something more towards the industry that everybody here would be interested in, um, which is like, for example, you go sit in your car. Now, most of the cars are set with using of cruise controls. Um, so cruise control is, is interesting. More you observe, more you find that there is a lot more to it. So for example, what I'm saying is when you're going on cruise control, um, one thing is it needs to maintain the velocity if there is no, uh, no, for example, you go, you set a velocity uh, at which you wanted to drive. And then as long as there is no car in front, the car does its um, no regulation of the vehicle velocity. But the moment there is another car that is in front of you, it, it converts itself into saying, uh, uh, a distance problem, which is basically saying maintain a distance between these two cars, forget about what the velocity is because you need to maintain a safe distance. So this switching between a velocity control to a distance control makes it more, um, so, no, may more interesting problem. So more deeper you go into any controls problem, you can, you can, um, uh, you can keep adding more and more, uh, to get more control over what you wanted to. Uh, so this is what controls is all about. So more, you can add, keep on adding, uh, doing some adaptive controls, doing some model-based controls, model predictive control. So even a small problem that you take will, will start to include a lot more um, requirements, I would say. So you can add, keep on adding requirements into the system to control what you want. Um, on the right, you see now the electric cars have been um, becoming when Tesla started or had been electric cars in the industry. But once Tesla started making um, and selling Model 3s, Model X, Model, Model S, now there is motor control in the cars everywhere. So what, what you're seeing here is there is a high voltage battery that is, um, that is driving this uh, permanent magnet uh, motor. So what you're trying to control is basically the speed and the torque at the, the wheels that are available um, so that the vehicle can get a traction, can go in reverse, um, and kind of trying to regulate the speed that you want to. So the, the speed that you regulate on, uh, on a cruise control now needs to be controlled using this motor to maintain um, that velocity that you see on the vehicle. Um, so there is motor controls and there is controls application. How do you con start controlling this motor and um, active suspension control? Um, so I'm very much interested in such vehicle dynamics where um, what you do is you have a spring damper system. You can actively control what is the varied length of this um, spring damper as, as you travel and ride on the car, right? For example, you, you press your pedal, all of a sudden go to a full throttle from a zero throttle. What happens is there's a weight transfer happens from the front of the car to the rear of the car. So what you do is if you, if you next time when you drive on the car, um, in your car, just, just press your pedal and then you can feel that you're going behind, right? right? So it, it pulls you back. Um, and what this active suspension control basically does is 
inside within you should not feel this moving behind or pulling away from you know you getting pulled back and what it tries to do is it tries to increase or decrease these damper settings actively so that you do not feel this um, because you are inside setting in the chassis um, and this is all happening in the tire um, so the weight transfer happen to the tire and then but you are actively controlling these um, damper and spring settings in such a way that you don't feel that and so if you go go watch videos on youtube to say that okay wash has tried to do something like that audi audi has it and you can try to see that uh, it um, what what happens at while driving doesn't feel into your in in, in what you when you're sitting in, in, inside the chassis right like so when you brake your the weight transfer happens to the front when you're when you're accelerating the weight transfer happens to the rear and then finally but the chassis that you're sitting inside uh, the vehicle chassis that you're sitting inside should not feel these um, uh, uh, active suspension con control does that and and there is flight controls and what is um, and I'm I'm I, I have a private pilot license, um, so I fly, uh, but not these uh, uh, military flights. But why I say here it's a military flight because here you can see that elevator and aileron is combined together as a LE1. Um, um, so basically, what what I'm trying to drive away point is um, even they have control surfaces and uh, to control. Uh, so based for example, the rudder does the yaw control. Elevator does your pitch control. Um, um, so there is an actuator, there's a sensor, and then you try to actuate um, based on what the sensor is giving and what you want to desire uh, based on your actuator movement. So everywhere around you look, um, there is a sensor, there is an actuator, there is some control that is happening. And that is what I want to drive, drive, drive away here from this slide. Um, moving on, just concentrating more towards automotive. Um, there is tons of ECU now uh, sitting in the in the in the cars, trying to do uh, controls. Uh, so this is this is one of the few examples that you can see. This is one of the famous slides that, when I was trying to search to see, okay, how much of the controls is happening within within a car, and just imagine the complexity that the car goes through, and all of the ECUs communicating all together. So they are connected to CAN buses, they are connected in LIN buses, uh, trying to communicate across the key key variables that it needs to control. For example, you have your engine control and you have your hill hold control when you're on a hill, trying to hold uh, and trying to uh, let not, not let you not go uh, no, uh, go in reverse and anti-lock braking system, electronic stability control, lane departure warning. And just imagine to all this, now we add autonomous controls that come kind of is picking up everywhere and a lot of people are working on, on, on autonomous controls. So just wanted to, show the amount of controls when you just take a car alone and uh, um, um, and now you have electric cars and there's battery battery management. So there's 12 volt battery management, there is high voltage, which is like 350 to 400 volts that you get on a high voltage, which is basically complete electric car. Um, uh, so, so you need to, if, so for example, this high voltage battery, there is a lot of safety involved. So when do you close the contractors of the battery and when do you open the contactors, you also want to make, make sure that the high voltage is not on the chassis of the car when somebody goes and sits in the car. What if there is a, a high voltage leak? Um, so there is everything comes, uh, such requirements come into controls and then the controls engineer um, um, goes and thinks about what sensors does he need, what actuators does he need, and tries to implement um, uh, a safe controls. So it is about safety, it is also, it's also about comfort, um, uh, so there is a lot, lot of requirements that flow, flow to you as a controls engineer, and then you capture all this in a platform, and then you start applying uh, and writing either in, in a code form, in a, in a MATLAB simulink model, and then you, uh, you give it to a test engineers, controls test engineers who, gives, who drives this testing and then says that, okay, this is good to go for production. So, um, so moving on. Coming to the topic. Um, so all this while um, I was trying to show you um, how how controls is all over the place um, and uh, and every industry almost has it. It is and the controls is everywhere around you. But as a controls engineer, how do you, how do you design it and how do you how do you go about um, uh, doing controls design? Um, this slide gives you one uh, overview of of where do you start. Um, first, you start with something called plant system modeling. So when I say plant, as, as we have spoken in other, our examples earlier, um, a fan, 
controlling that the motor controls the fan speed, right? The motor speed basically translates to the fan speed there. The first example that we started speaking. So that becomes our plan in that example. Um, the second example that we spoke is basically uh, your valve, uh, your valve control, the valve becomes your actuator and then the valve is controlling how the, um, um, the hot, hot and the cold fluids are coming in um, uh, when you control the valve. So that becomes your plant. And then be, uh, the valve becomes your actuator. But moving this actuator says how much the temperature comes out of the, of the shower valve. Uh, so that becomes your plant. Um, so, and, um, so these are some of the, so the motor control has a motor, motor has a plant. And the cruise control model will be like your vehicle will be a plant modeling. Um, uh, so the basic plant modeling involves uh, it starts with some physics based modeling. So what you what you bring in is all of the physics that you have learned in your um, in your um, uh, 12 standard and your 10 standard physics. And then you go into your bachelor's, you also start learning more into your physics. Uh, so you do some. So when I say physics, um, it, it is like your Newton's law applications. Um, and then you also do some conservation of energy conservation, mass conservation. So these equations uh, start to play uh, and give you an idea of, um, of the plan that you're trying to model. Um, so so, so the, once you start going into a problem, you will see a lot of tons of papers written on. The, so it's not a new, it's not you're reinventing your, the wheel again, right? So there is there is some amount of research that is already done and you start from that basics modeling, which is basically a basic equation to start with. But what if I completely don't understand what this plant is? So there are some methods called as black box modeling, which is basically like, you don't know anything about the plant and now you want to try to under, start to understand uh, by doing some testing on the plant. So this, this type of modeling is called a system identification or a black box modeling. A gray box modeling with its name itself is suggesting is you know a partial information of a plant and then you have some test data with you and then you start to do something called gray box modeling. Um, so this is, this is to start with um, what you do is plant system um, modeling. Then you come on to analyzing that data, whatever you have, you do it in time domain and you do it in frequency domain, which is basically saying that you start to control um, something or try to, so we can take an example in the, late, uh, in the, in the later slides, you will see how, how we are going to, how, how are we going to uh, go about this problem? Um, uh, or how do you see this? How, how is this plant system analysis done? Um, this is just an overview. Uh, so you start doing something like time domain analysis, which is basically over time, when you give an input to the plant, how does the plant react to um, that input? And frequency is basically that input that you give into the plant is varied at various frequency. For example, um, you are driving at um, the throttle that you're pressing on the engine. So, right, like you press your, uh, in your you're sitting in a car, you, you can either press this throttle, you go full on, like at a step, at, you just do a step knock. So you go from zero to hundred in just like a few seconds. Or what you can do is you can, you can keep on throttling it up and down at a high frequency. Like what you do is you, you keep shaking your um, um, foot and then you can give that as an input as at a high frequency input signal to the throttle. So what happens to the plant then? So that drives how is the plant behaving at a different frequency, and then you can start ex extracting the behavior of the plant at a different input signal, uh, either either as a as a steady state input or a, or you can do it as um, um, uh, frequency, which is basically you do the input signal at a higher frequency and see how the plant behaves. Um, once you have that, you start tuning your plant parameters. So any any model. Uh, will start involving what is called as plant parameter. So for example, if you take the example of that motor, uh, what happens is you can have the dampness uh, inside the, um, when the motor spins. So you have damping around uh, where, where the motor is spinning. Um, uh, so this parameter is basically will be tuned. Um, not every time the, the supplier is going to give you these parameters. Sometimes this data is not available to you. You start tuning this parameter using the data that you have. Um, um, so they're in, in order to match. So for example, you start testing and you see that your model data is different from what the test data is showing. You start comparing and you start tweaking the parameters to tune so that it matches the test data. Um, so that, that involves some model, model parameter tuning. And once you are done with all this, uh, first few steps, what you have is basically a plan to that you can actually have a good, good model for, and then you move on to some system design, control system design. Some, for example, here, our PID is like a proportional integral 
derivative control um, is one of the basic uh, controls. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have heard, but for someone who is who's new to controls field, um, PID stands for proportional integral and uh, derivative control design, um, uh, which we will see in the in in the later slides how this uh, PID in short um, uh, uh, on a, on a demo problem uh, how do we use this PID control uh, in in actuate in controlling this actuator so that the plant does what we want to do right so we'll have a small sensor uh, we'll have a um, we'll design this control PID in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a very vague manner but still this tries to control the actuator and regulates what we need from the plant. So this involves some, something called gain design. Um, there is something called Bode plots and controller performance metrics. So we'll, I think we'll come to this later slides where you can see how all of this is done rather than going deeper into the uh, solution right now. So that is, that is the high level overview of how the controls um, goes through its design, right? Um, but when it comes to sitting in an industry and working for them, uh, it goes through a certain process. And I wanted to bring, up, bring this um, uh, topic of what is called as the V model. Uh, so you can, as you see from the name, it is, it is kind of takes the shape of the V. And this is highly used in, 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 in industries and uh, in controls. Um, this process is highly followed. And you can see wherever you go into, uh, so in any of the mm -hmm. local automotive industries that you wanted to go step into and then speak to a controls engineer, I'm sure they'll speak about this V process. Um, it's just that we, we need these processes in place so that everything comes together in the right place and then it is available for everyone um, to have access to. And um, so that is, that is what we are trying to do here. So how does a control process start is something as I have, probably by now you have heard me say requirement. So what is a requirement, right? Like basically what I'm saying is for somebody to design this fan regulator, even in, in, um, uh, for, for a manufacturer, right? He needs to know what level one corresponds to a particular resistance, level two corresponds to a particular resistance, right? And, uh, and the level three. So I'm talking about the fan regulator movement. As you move the regulator, there is each regulator point that you are putting on the fan corresponds to a particular resistance. So somebody needs to define that. Um, and, and that comes from how, when you put it in this resistance, how is the fan speed and uh, varying, right? So all these requirements as a controls engineer, you work with the systems. So when you say systems is something like a plant guy, like someone who is working on the plant. So um, I come from the system, uh, uh, I come from the controls background um, and I, but I'm also from a mechanical engineering background. Um, so I, I understand a lot of the mechanical engineering systems. For example, your car has an AC system and it's a refrigerant, refrigeration system, right? It has a condenser, it has a compressor, it has a evaporator, and there is refrigerant in it. And hopefully everybody uh, who is in the field of mechanical engineering probably would have understood um, there is thermodynamic cycles that you've heard of. Um, so. For me, I understand the system, but I'm not going as deeper as a plant engineer or a systems engineer into the um, uh, into understanding the plant. But what I do as a controls engineer is sit with them to understand what their requirements are. Um, where do they want, how, how, what is the safety behind that I need to maintain? For example, the compressor should never go beyond this particular limit of RPM. Um, and the refrigeration system has a refrigerant and it has pressures. Uh, refrigerant goes to uh, uh, 20 bar pressure and uh, the system design says, don't cross the system pressure beyond 20 bar. Then I need to regulate my compressor speed such that the pressure doesn't go beyond that. So all these come under requirements um, and these requirements need to be captured some in some platform called JAMA or Polarion. Uh, so these are very, uh, varied uh, requirement management tools uh, where somebody goes uh, from the system side and then say, hey, don't do um, don't cross the system pressure beyond this and regulate the compressor speed um, uh, um, in such a way that the system pressures doesn't blow up to beyond 20 bar. So they capture these and then they also give us details of how, uh, so they don't give us the details of how this needs to be achieved. All they say is, okay, to be safer, do this um, uh, and be within the safer limits of 20 bar, right? So they don't tell us how. So that is what is captured in what is called as JAMA or Polarion. Uh, if, you, if you Google, you'll know what these software platforms are. So that is where the requirements are captured. 
then you go into something called once you have these high level requirements you do some high level design for your controls okay what needs to be basic things that needs to be available in the controls right like some sensors that you are looking for in order to do for me when i said the pressure needs to be not should not go beyond 20 bar i need to have a pressure sensor that is measuring at a appropriate location and it needs to be at uh uh it needs to be with this precision it needs to be with this tolerance and accuracy levels and you also start drawing basic architecture diagram for your controls to make sure that whatever requirements that is captured in this uh, uh in the previous step uh you include that in your design and next you start doing is you start going into simulink or matlab platforms to start designing this or you can also use your embedded coder which is basically you do your visual So C C code or a C C plus C plus plus coding, ah, uh, you start implementing these um, uh, controls, and very important is version control, um, which is basically a lot of people are working on your controls, and uh, they need to be. Um, uh, so, for example, if you take a system like a AC refrigeration system, uh, there is several modules in just an AC system, like right, like for example, um, there is a fan control. So you are sitting in your car. Uh, i'm talking about the ac system when you're sitting in the car you have a blower control right like you when you switch on the ac there is one thing that controls the temperature that is coming out and there is something that is controlling the air flow which is like a blower fan uh, so there is a blower module in addition to this uh, compressor control that i have so if you take a controls controls have several modules like for example i have a comp- one module for compressor one module for blower everybody is writing software independently and then all of this software needs to go into a particular release and it goes into a particular version control um like git uh, at at this point um so these are some of the examples i'm sure there is more tools but i'm giving like one of one or two examples with what what happens in in our industries that we see around um so the git basically does is you are writing the software you push that version into the into a cloud and then make sure that uh, everybody gets access to the software that you have written like a test engineer can go and take that version whatever you say is the version that you want to get tested he goes and gives you a feedback and then you start again correcting this so this is a iterative process that goes between implementation and design um and you also start so all of this on the left hand side of the v is all including about the design of controls and all of this on the right right hand side what you start, see is basically is testing um uh, so somebody needs to test it and somebody uh, has to validate it so often this is done by some other engineer apart from who is implementing is because the implementer can be biased right for example if i write some code i can bias my test uh in such a way that it everything pass and then i can show my manager like every, everything has passed so that is not what we want so somebody in in the testing team also understand what the systems are what is the requirements are he goes and he does a bunch of testing so what what i'm showing here are some acronyms here which is basically mil sil pil and pil um mil stand for um, model in the loop testing sl stands for software in the loop testing pil stands for hardware in the loop testing and pil stands for the processor where your control is basically embedded in so processor and loop test uh so this is these are several uh, ways of testing your um, implemented code or implemented design of uh, of your controls um so when i say model model in the loop is basically what you do is um, your controls design is implemented as a simulink model right so that is what is we call it as this this model is in loop with the plant model so when i say plant as we spoke earlier is your motor is your refrigeration system and your controls is still in your simulink or a matlab um design or it can be in a embedded c c++ um so when i say model is more towards matlab simulink uh um so what what you do is you hook up this plant model with the plant with the plant model uh and start to test your controller model with the plant in loop so for example the controller says move your compressor to this speed and the plant will respond saying the pressures are this and then you start controlling this and see how your results are uh, in a model in the loop in the case of software in the loop what you do is you take the simulink or uh, simulink code simulink uh, simulink model you start generating code um um and you generate a um uh, uh, embedded coder uh, which is basically embedded c code uh, which is what is our software so you put that software in loop with the plant and then start testing it so what happens between this model and the uh, model in the loop and software in the loop is basically 
there might be errors that you miss when you do from the model in the loop and the software in the loop uh, as you as you as you convert that and there would be a lot of uh, conversion errors that could go through in between and uh, so all of that gets gets tested in the software in the loop and the hardware in the loop is basically um, what you do is you take the software whatever you generated and flash it into the processor actually and um, and your hardware is basically a plant um, uh, the the actuators that you have in the system for example your compressor uh, or for example the sensors that you have in the system um, will, so how does the sensor work sensor is basically sending you some voltages right like for example a temperature sensor in your car would probably send some some voltage and that voltage corresponds to some temperature and that is given by the by the supplier and that kind of hardware is actually simulated in in your health um, say for example, what if the sensor fails? The sensor has a short circuit. Um, so such kind of failures can be captured in in the hill. Um, and and similarly, you can do also start doing what is called as process and loop, where you start flashing this code and you have a plant model that is still as a model, and then you uh, you um, start testing your processor uh, uh, in loop with the model to see how the how the processor behaves. So for example, what might go wrong is uh, if if uh, some some manufacturer starts playing around with the with the processor, um, right? For example, if I choose a Infineon processor and then I flash my code, probably they have some limitations that what my controls model will not accept. And uh, uh, you want to test that controls which actually worked in the model in the loop, but it doesn't work in the processor in the loop. So you want to get rid of those kind of test test cases. Um, so you want to write those test cases in the processor uh, when you flash this code into the processor. So this is one of the standard testing um, as a test engineer, controls test engineer that you would be doing. Um, and then slowly then, so this is this all you can see, you are not talking anything about vehicle, right? And then slowly you start moving into mule vehicles or vehicle buck, which is basically you start putting this processor in the car and then you start testing. And then slowly you move into production vehicles and these are some of vector tools or CANU, CANALYZER, CANAPE is basically you're measuring some uh, CAN signals, you're measuring some LIN signals where, which the sensor is on, which the actuator is on. Um, uh, and you also have in, in, in some software, in, in actually this platform called CANU, you can actually access what the processor, when you flash the code, uh, what the memory, um, uh, memory variables are actually seeing, like for example, you want to see what the compressor speed is. You can go to Canoe and then you can type it there. Or you want to have a state of the system that you want to see. For example, um, uh, you have a state variable in your plan that you want to measure. Or you have your controls and you have written a bunch of controls and you want to tap an intermediate variable um, that you're using for controls, which you don't want to actually um, send it out on CAN, but still you want to view it uh, um, on, on the, what, is, what is calculated by the processor with it. And uh, this is for debugging, right? Like so you use Cano tools to debug and try to fix the controls, what you have done. Um, so this is one of um, the V process, uh, the complete V process. I'm, I'm sure this is, this is uh, a lot of information altogether, but this is, I just want to give you an overview of uh, how the controls works. Um, so here, what you see is basically um, uh, the software and hardware uh, kind of exchange the information between each other and the hardware has its own requirements and software has its own requirements. And each time there's a hardware change, you need to go back and test um, uh, the controls, whether does it work. For example, a sensor now, which is a hardwired sensor, they go on to a LIN sensor. Um, so when I say LIN is a, it's a communication, um, um, communication network, CAN is a communication network. So when, for example, sensor, somebody decides on the system side saying, hey, the sensor that is on the hardwire is not giving me a feedback, and then we ask them to change to the CAN software because the CAN for some time, for sometimes what, what the supplier does of the sensor supplier does is he can give us a feedback of, of, of some of some more information. For example, uh, whether the sensor has, has, has a faulty, um, um, uh, um, for example, it has electrically shorted and he gives, the sensor gives that information. So we have gone, there, we have gone and asked the systems team to change to a LIN based sensor and then, then we the controls are again go back goes back and then tests the previously written requirements and the implementation goes and uh, goes and tests that for the new hardware that we have implemented, right? So um, the the slide here basically drives the point that uh, there is a dependency between the software and the hardware, and each time the hardware changes, the software needs to go back and test it, and uh, you can see that there is an integration between hardware and software that happens here. 
And finally, it is integrating with the rest of the systems. And then there is a whole overall vehicle testing that happens at the later stage.